Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it's obviously like such an honor to talk to a literal Canadian broadcasting icon. So, so thank you for that. And, and uh, for for people that don't automatically recognize the name Steve Armitage, the voice is so recognizable. It's like I I'm sure there's many people that feel the same way. It's like my youth. If I turn on sport that your I would just hear your voice between watching the Olympics or watching hockey or or the CFL which you broadcast for the CBC for 56 years I think and decades doing the CFL and and um and hockey night in Canada so it's it's uh it's pretty amazing to to have met you last summer and to get to have you on this today I guess my voice is a giveaway <laughs> right right I always like doing that when people uh, expect a certain voice out of me. Uh, yes, my voice uh, many times has uh, been my calling card as opposed to my face. And uh, down through the years, I've had a lot of people say, aren't you, I recognize the voice, but I, I really don't know the name. And so I introduced myself and they say the giveaway was the voice. It's, uh, I've heard the voice so many times on so many different things uh, down through the years. And like yourself, uh, you remember my voice growing up. And uh, that's how long I've been in the business. Right. Yeah, it's, it's so, and, and also the, 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 sp- the things that you called are so iconic, right? Like to call so many Olympic events. The one to me personally is, I, I, I don't think this is the case. I think I would remember. I don't think you ever called judo as a judo athlete. That's the one where that might be, that might be the only sport you didn't call with the number of Olympics that you've been involved with. Um, it's almost surprising you haven't. No, I never called judo at the Olympic level. I did some judo. Uh, remember when Doug Rogers uh, was uh, competing, and uh, Doug would come into BC. I lived and worked in BC, in Vancouver for 38 years, and uh, I did some judo uh, with Doug, uh, but never at the national or international or certainly the Olympic level. Uh, judo for me and a lot of commentators uh, is a very complicated sport to call because there are certain defined moves uh, that you have to see and identify almost instantaneously and if you don't then you're missing out on on what judo is all about right when I called um, the games last summer with Karen who had called a number of sports and she called a number of sports with you and we both uh, a mutual friend and just an awesome person it, it I felt bad at times because uh, obviously she's the seasoned pro and I'm the judoka and action can happen so instantaneously and it felt like every time she would come across with an interesting question or or start um, feeding some information that would be the moment that someone would throw or there'd be a near throw and I'd have to jump in and be, you know, and uh, it was a funny, because you, you really don't know when it's going to happen. It can be, it can seem slow for three minutes and then one person gets the right grip and they're going flying and um, it was a, it was a bit of a challenge, I think, and, and uh, obviously, and the other aspect of judo, like many sports, it has its own language but its language is connected to Japanese. So that makes it a little trickier when every throw name is Uchimara, Sewinage, Osorogari. That's not common language for most people. So uh, yeah, so that makes it a little tricky. I had a secret. Uh, When I was dealing with a sport that I wasn't terribly familiar with, I would set up the, the competitors and then I would just simply turn to you and say, Josh, and you would take it, and then I would jump in uh, when the score came up. Um, But yeah, I would never try to pretend I understood what was happening uh, when I had a very capable uh, color analyst uh, sitting next to me who could explain all the nuances and all the subtleties and, and 
and the things that made a difference in, a, in the sport. So that was my secret. I would just set it up and then give it to my color analyst. Right. And um, the, yeah, it's, it, it's funny, like as a judoka, there's like a, because judo is just not popular in the same way in Canada as it is in other parts of the world, there's this funny thing about us wanting it to be popular. So, for instance, there's a show right now about Julia Child. Uh, it's really good. It's on Crave or something. And so, it, but it's a it's an ongoing television show, and her husband refers to the dojo and doing judo almost every episode. At one point, you see him in the judo gi and the black belt. And I get this funny feeling all the, whenever I see things like that or someone references it in a song. I'm like, maybe this will be the thing to make judo more popular. And so, uh, just hearing that you did judo again uh, with a t with an icon, uh, Doug Rogers, for people that aren't aware, he medaled at the first ever Olympics that Canada was in for judo. That the, that had uh, judo in the Olympics, 1964 Olympics, he took a silver medal for Canada. I had the opportunity to meet him a couple times and um, and really great guy, sadly he passed away uh, a couple years ago. But um, yeah, he, I mean, the first ever Olympics that had judo, he medaled in it as a Canadian is, is a big point of pride for us. And hearing that you practiced judo in, uh, a number of years ago and practiced it with Doug Rogers is, is pretty cool to me. I'll tell you the secret to promoting a sport and getting a sport uh, more coverage. Um, all you have to do is, as you mentioned, win a medal at the World Championships or the Olympics. And all of a sudden, the media, especially CBC, will take notice and, and start to cover uh, judo at the World Cup, World Championship level, and then, of course, give it full play during the Olympics, if you have somebody who is capable of, of winning a medal. Unfortunately, a lot of sports who never get to that level don't get the coverage they deserve, and they're constantly fighting to uh, make their sport more popular through the media, and that's the key. If you're lucky enough to, to find somebody who is capable of competing at that level and winning medals, then the publicity and the coverage will follow. Yeah, and the we spoke about this um, when when we met last summer. Is that I, I I don't remember how many Olympics it was before you called a medal for Canada, but it was quite a number. And I was so fortunate that not only did I get to call a medal for Canada last summer, I got to call two medals. Those two medals were by women. It's the first time a Canadian woman had ever medaled at the Olympics. And moreover, we had two other athletes narrowly miss the medals. Um, in, in judo, you have bronze medal matches, so you have two bronzes and two fifths. So if you lose the bronze medal, you take fifth place. So we had Shadi al Nahas and Arthur Mergelli Don lose the bronze medal match but compete for a medal, which is really exciting for us. And then Jessica Klimkate, the second ever world champion from Canada, and Katrin Bushman Pinard both medaled, and it was the first women's medal. So um, it was like, it was so amazing to get to call this piece of history, Canadian sporting history. These were the first women to medal, and the first time I ever called the game. So that was, that was pretty awesome. And I can guarantee you that um, by 2024 in Paris, judo will be on the map. CBC will pay attention and in their planning they will look back uh, at Japan and say ha huh, the Canadians had two medals um, and they will come to you and say what are our chances of medals this time around and it will move up the priority chart and therefore it gets more exposure the medals that you won in Japan gave the sport exposure it probably hasn't had in the past and that will continue to grow as your your athletes uh, win more medals simple as that yeah so how, how many olympics was it do you remember how many olympics you called before you got to call a canadian medal well my point was i didn't get to call my first gold medal oh, right. until katrina made won gold in 1998 in nagano wow and 
course, she would do the same again in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. So not only did I get my first gold in 1998, but I was double gold by the time I got to 2002 right. in Salt Lake City. Uh, it's always a thrill uh -huh. um, because I had followed Katrina from the almost her very beginning mm -hmm. in uh, national and international speech getting. And when you get to know an athlete quite well, and you know what their ultimate goal is, and you're a part of that goal mm -hmm. when they win a medal, it's, mm -hmm. it's a real thrill, as it was for you right. um, in Japan, seeing those women win those medals. Um, for you not to get excited, and become passionate and involved uh, would have been rare. And uh, I've always told my analysts, um, try to control your emotion if you can, but right. let some of it out because right. the viewer understands and appreciates that. Right. And when you do it, uh, it's something that uh, I can't, you can't fake. Right. And, and when it comes out, let it go. And I, you worked with Karen Larson. I'll tell you an interesting story about Karen. Her sister was a member of Canada's synchronized swimming team in 1996 in Atlanta. And Karen was my color analyst. And uh, she was a, a little bit afraid of getting too involved in cheering for her sister. And I said, don't worry about it. Just let it happen. Let it come out. You are excited. You are emotional. She's mm -hmm. your sister, and she's about to win an Olympic medal. Mm -hmm. That's that's so awesome. Um, yeah, like that. Of all your experiences, that it's just such a unique one. It, I'm sure, obviously, it stands out. It oh, not only stands out for her; she gets to sit beside you and call this, and then for you to uh, like. Yeah, it's sort of hard to explain. Uh, the excitement that you get caught in when you're in the atmosphere of calling these games with other people as well and and so many of these the the color analysts are are former athletes as well and they know so many of the athletes so I have a really close relationship with the the coach at the time Sasha McMenovich who's who's coaching um, Katrin Boschman Penard so having I've known knowing him since I was 12 years old knowing how long he's worked with this athlete not only was there a connection to the athlete, Katrin, who I've met many times, but knowing the coach as well, it's, yeah, it's, that one I was slightly choked up, and I was like, I can't, I can't, it's okay to be a little choked up, but I can't get, uh, you know, too emotional, but it, it's, it was so, it was so exciting, and the one thing that really stood out to me from my experience, actually, was after you called so many Olympics, um, to see you, after you called the rowing gold, the women's rowing gold medal, so afterwards, I happened to be in the building when this happened in the, in the commentating area, common area, and you came in and there was like a glow and an excitement and it was so uh, obviously real. And so it was so nice that after so many years of doing this, that you were still so excited to call that gold medal. It's, it's just nice to see that the passion hadn't waned after all these years of doing this uh, job. No, it, it never does and uh, in that particular case it was totally unexpected the canadian women hadn't rowed internationally for about two and a half years because of covid so we really had no idea how good the canadian team was mm -hmm. the kiwis and the aussies had competed throughout covid so they were competition ready uh the Brits were kind of an unknown quantity, but they too had managed to row uh, internationally in Europe. So Canada really uh, was the only crew uh, that really didn't know how good they could be. And when they took that early lead, uh, it made things really interesting. And the question was, it's 2,000 meters, and that's a lot of racing. Mm -hmm. And as they continued to lead down the course, um, I got more, more and more involved along with my color commentator. And it was uh, one of the best races I've called in terms of uh, really not knowing the outcome, outcome. Most races were able to handicap, as you are with your matches in, in judo, right. um, based on past experience. 
and as they say in, in Japan and uh, and the women's aids uh, was totally an unknown and a very pleasant surprise um, and just to see the women how they reacted and celebrated uh, it was a lot of fun yeah and if I had a glow about me when I came out of the uh, uh, studio uh, yeah it was real I, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it as I have calling all of the all of the metal races this episode is brought to you by Table Tennis North. They work diligently to connect kids to the beautiful sport of table tennis, regularly going out of their way to teach these skills virtually or in person throughout the territory. Please check out what they're up to by clicking the link below. Yeah, that, that was, yeah, it was, it, it was an awesome race and it was just, it was like such an awesome moment to see. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I really appreciated is obviously we had a couple opportunities to speak and that obviously stood out to me and, and speaking going in and while I was while I was broadcasting and one thing that I was fortunate in a sense is judo isn't a small event at the Olympics. Um, COVID really affected the audience but obviously the birthplace of judo and the first Olympics for judo in 1964 were housed in that building um, and because judo was eight days of coverage I got to do it for many days and uh, and screw up a lot you know and get some feedback and which you provided which was amazing and and one thing that I don't know I don't I don't think I told you this but um, Bob Babinski, uh, he would provide me a great amount of feedback and one thing that he did during the games was after a couple of days I said, you know, I'd really like some feedback on, on my calls and how it's going so that I can do better. I've got five more days left. And he showed me a video from Pyeongchang of yourself and a, com and a color commentator. Now, I don't, I, he didn't tell me what sport it was, so I didn't even see the sport. It was a camera aimed at you two, not the sport that was happening. And your commentator was beside you, and you're calling some race. Again, I don't know the sport. I don't know who it was. And all that it was was you calling the sport. And it was so powerful to, to not see the sport, to not know what's happening, to not know what the race is. And it was you calling it and building up what was happening in the race. And then after a couple moments, you hand it over to the, com the color commentator and then you take the reins back. And without seeing the sport, without knowing the race, without knowing anyone that's in the race, I felt invested in the race. And he showed me that. And obviously this is, you know, you're such a, uh, a professional and so amazing at it but it was really powerful for me to see that like how much gravitas your voice can affect I didn't see what was happening and I felt like oh my god who's gonna win you know and I didn't see what was happening I had no idea and it was it was really powerful to me um, I went to school for sound engineering so I understand that you know sound effects and all that kind of things but just to hear someone's voice in that way was really amazing for me. So I just wanted to say it was it was so cool. It was a really cool thing of Bob to show me that, but man, like what a reference to watch. It made me maybe a little more insecure, but also excited about the potential. Uh, you have to remember that I was calling racing and racing has a beginning, a middle and an end. And, and you can start low and build and build and build until they cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. um, your event is a little different, uh, so you would use a different tone, uh, a different way of building um, the emotion and, and uh, creating an atmosphere where the viewer will stay with you. Whenever I talk to people like yourself, um, I'm always stressing the fact that you're telling a story, and if you sound like you're bored and not terribly interested. The viewer has a choice now with that remote control. They can go to one of 50 or 100 to 150 stations. So you've got to keep them with you. And you do that by generating excitement. And, and the more enthusiastic you are in telling the story, the more likely they are to stay with you. It's as simple as that. We're storytellers. Right. and make your stories exciting, interesting, compelling, so that they won't go away. And, and that's what I've tried to do down through the years in my commentary. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Oftentimes when you get a really exciting event, like the Women's Eight in Tokyo, um, all I do is hitch my 
wagon to that star mm -hmm. and let it pull me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to work hard to create an interesting and exciting story. Right. Uh, that's when you're really challenged as a broadcaster. But if the athletes are doing their job, you just sit back, basically relax and, and let them do the work right. instead of you trying to make it exciting. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess the, the other thing that's usually not a challenge, which I look forward to in terms of Paris, another country that judo is incredibly popular, is that for the Paris Games, audiences should be back. And when there's no audience at all, you know, for judo, there was maybe 75 people that were other athletes from other countries watching the event. When you're quiet, it was a pretty quiet atmosphere. So the idea of a natural atmosphere would probably be a little beneficial as well. You know, hearing the people cheering, like I, I can remember so many times watching singing, uh, swimming events, you know, which is a, which is a, a events that I always love to watch. And you can hear the, the bit of the rumble of the crowd and, and that makes a big difference. And for people that are big cinephiles or into movies a lot, you know, if you ever watch a horror movie, I'd say probably 75% of the part that scares you is the sound design and the sound effects that go into it. Um, so in this case, you're the soundtrack providing that. And that's, and that was the part that was so neat to me is there isn't music building. This isn't a highlight reel. It's your voice. And that building of the momentum in your voice was such a powerful, was such a powerful thing. And, and, uh, so, and it, and it, you know, you think back to all those games and all those moments in sport and it's like part of the reason we get so invested and so many times that I got invested in my life was literally your voice doing that. So, so super, super cool to, to hear and see you do it in person. I'll tell you who was, who was probably the best at that was Bob Cole. Bob was the voice of Hockey Night in Canada on CBC Radio and uh, CBC Television for years and years. And I would be in my living room, in, in my kitchen, and I could hear Bob's voice. Mm -hmm. And I knew when to come in and watch because Bob had that great ability to bring his voice up. And I thought, whoa, whoa, I can hear Bob getting excited. That must mean something's about to happen. I right. would come in and watch it on the living room. That was the power of Bob's voice. And he did it better than anybody else that I know. He was really terrific at that. Yeah, the, the other one that, um, the other, growing up, um, I was born in 82, so a couple of years after the Blue Jays had, had been, um, had, had started is, is uh, the Toronto Blue Jays have a long history of really great um, voices too, which which I think that's another one that played an impact. Like I was, exp I never thought that I was a fan of commentators because it's just part of the sporting event until you go in to do the role yourself and then you start thinking of these iconic calls like Tom Cheeks and the Touch 'Em All Joe, You'll Never Hit a Bigger One uh, by Tom Cheeks when the Blue Jays won the World Series or I also had the opportunity to meet Dan Schulman, who's just such a baseball broadcasting icon and another uh, incredible voice. He, he did uh, basketball when we were there um, the, in, last summer. And um, yeah, just such an awesome voice to hear him. And, and I've always, something about baseball, because baseball is such a slow game, I think commentating plays such a big factor that there's so much airtime to fill. So back to the part of the storytelling, there's so much storytelling that goes on and so much information that people can get across and you get this connection. In so many sports, we call it our team when obviously we're not involved, right? I'm not, I have no involvement in the Toronto Blue Jays, but that's my team. And so, you know, you hear when they tell the stories of, you know, Danny Jansen when he's younger in life and how he became the catcher that he is, you get such a connection. And I think that's one thing about baseball that that I really love is is hearing all those stories getting told during the action, and you have a lot of opportunity for that in baseball. Yes, you do, and uh, it's it's a sport that's quite unique that way. Uh, most sports, um, there's a lot more action in in baseball. There are some very dramatic and exciting moments, but most of the time it, it it's slow and it builds. Uh, so you have to fill in the gaps, as you said, by telling stories, little anecdotes. In broadcasting, we call them gems. Having a gem in your pocket to pull out, Shulman's very good at that. Um, 
when there's kind of a lull in the action, he would start telling you something about of the history of these two teams or, or give you background information on the hitter or the pitcher or, uh, you know, the shortstop. Um, and he picks the right time to tell that story. Right. Uh, so it doesn't interfere with the actual play-by-play. -play. But it's a unique talent. And somebody like uh, Schulman and Vince Scully uh, mm -hmm. did it so, so very well. Right. And it, it really is a gift if you can do it. Um, game after game, because don't forget, they do a lot of baseball over the course of the season. To do it, to make it sound interesting and not repeating yourself, so you get fresh stories. And the way you do that is like you did with your uh, judo, is you talk to the athletes or the coaches, and you get background information about the families, the brothers, sisters, um, some kind of uh, information that's personal, but you're able to use on the air to tell your story. It's, it's very important um, that you bring the viewer into the life of the athlete uh, that is competing. And it's kind of a, a difficult uh, assignment, but it's one that's really necessary uh, to make it interesting for the viewer. Because if you just keep talking about the athlete and their accomplishments, I need to know something about their background, mm -hmm. uh, about their education, their future plans, and, and that makes them human. And, and that brings the viewer in to your commentary and, and makes it more interesting for the viewer. Yeah, that's the one um, area that I've always found fascinating too. I think it's maybe growing up a baseball fan is um, Every single high performance athlete has a very unique story and it does make them relatable. Most athletes come from these humble beginnings and you know, uh, they all have incredible, every time you look into an athlete there's always something about them that makes it unique because everybody is unique. And what makes them extra unique is that, so one, they have a story just like someone you might know and had struggles like someone you might know but then they became the best in the world at something. So what, what did they do differently to get to that position and how common it is? And the other thing that I was hoping to touch on, and I'm sure you have a ton of stories like this, is to me, whenever, when I think about athletes, I often think about how the small town athletes hit way above their weight class so often. It's so common that you hear of Patrick Marlowe who I think his hometown in Saskatchewan is like 50 people played the most games in the history of the NF uh, in, the, in the history of the NHL, and there's so t so many times that athletes come from these small humble beginnings like that. And I was wondering if you ever had any theory telling so many of these stories. Like, what do you think it is that makes it so common that there's definitely uh, amazing athletes from Toronto and Hamilton and Vancouver and Montreal, but there's so many from you know towns we don't I can't even n know the name of. Um, yeah. I think the answer to that question is, is very simple. If you're living in a small town, what is there to do? What else is there to do but to play your sport, whether it be hockey or baseball or badminton or snooker or whatever? You, you uh, are consumed by it because there's not a lot of other things to do in a small community. and. Uh, those communities are usually well organized with whatever sport they're, they're involved in mm -hmm. um, so that they get to play a lot, they get to compete a lot, and so they become good um, in these small towns and then they gradually move up to their centers and train, national training centers and, and places like Vancouver, Toronto and Montreal so they can compete against better uh, opposition on an ongoing basis. But originally, they, they start out in these small towns and they become good because that's all there is to do. Mm -hmm. And they can spend a lot of time. There are very few distractions. In Vancouver and Toronto today, just think of the hundreds of different things that a young athlete is able to do other than the sport. Right. So it's, it's really getting tougher, and you must be finding this, to get an athlete to commit to the sport, 
And if you're going to be a, a world-class international athlete, it really requires a huge commitment mm -hmm. in terms of the hours that you have to spend getting to the top. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a tough challenge. And unfortunately for us, a lot of kids are saying, why? What do I want to do that for? Mm -hmm. You know, six, seven hours a day, right. five, six, seven days a week. Right. It's, it's not as common now to find people that are willing to commit to those kind of hours. Right. Especially in a sport like yours, where the pot at the end of the rainbow isn't that big. I mean, you get an Olympic medal, but you can't go pro and, and make a ton of money. Right. Whereas if I'm a high school basketball player and I'm recruited by uh, Illinois or Duke, mm -hmm. and I get a free ride, and then I go to the NBA, I can make a fortune. Right. So that has a certain amount of attraction. That was one of the big attractions for hockey players down through the years. It was a chance to perhaps, if I was lucky enough to get to the NHL and make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing the, you know, the thousands and thousands that play the game and don't go mm -hmm. to the NHL, but right. the dream is always there. Right. Yeah, and I guess, um... Yeah, for knowing that there's a potential career that, and now in those professional sports, it's not just a lot of money, it's generational wealth, which is like, you know, you hear of NBA players with $150 million contracts and stuff, and it's, um, it's pretty incredible amounts of money. And I think maybe that's the other part of, um, of amateur sport that I guess I can appreciate in some way. It's just, the people that do do it at that level, there's there's so much passion for it. There's so much love for the sport, and and you know you'll see the online arguments or in in person arguments where people are fighting about aspects that maybe don't have that much importance in a sense, and it's because people are so passionate about it. It's like like me when I say you know I hear someone mention judo, I hear you mention that you did judo, and there's like a point of pride to me. I'm like, oh my goodness, he did judo. That's so amazing. Like. You just feel so connected by that community and and to the point about uh, the small town too yeah it's like in my hometown my hometown's 2700 people in uh, southwestern Ontario uh, you know three hour drive from Toronto and not exactly a hotbed for where you think judo would blow up but Chantal Primo uh, a couple years older than me became a national champion my brother Sean became a national champion and I competed internationally as well my brother competed at Junior Pan Ams and Commonwealth Championships from a town of 2700 people doing judo in a in a town hall where we rolled the mats out and my mom did the bookkeeping for the dojo it's just sort of wild in a sense to think of the success we had from this small little club and and that's not unusual. That, uh, right. I've heard that story so many times. Right. Where one sport seems to become the sport to do in the small town. Yeah. And it starts to produce people like yourself. Yeah, and uh, the, the other thing is that I think is maybe um, undervalued to some degree is that when you're in larger communities, larger cities, there's, and now even more so, is life isn't as community-based as it used to be. You live in a part of the country that I absolutely love. I, I love where I live as well, but I, I'm living in Yellowknife, for people that don't know, Northwest Territories. So the Northwest Territories, the entire territory's population is just over 40,000 people in an area that's one and a half times the geographic size of Ontario. So it's an immense and it's small communities. Um, and you're, you're living in Nova Scotia, and I love the Maritimes. I've been to PEI. I'm actually going out east this summer for about um, 10 days with my children. I love the East Coast, and what you have in the East Coast and what you have up here uh, and what you have in these small communities is really communities. People live in communities, and when you live in Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal, if there's, it's really, life is fast-paced, and there's neighborhoods, but it's not quite the same. There's a real disconnect. It's expensive to live there. People are really busy with work. They have to run to work, and then they have to pick their kids up at daycare. And, and what you have in small towns, like we were in the newspaper every single time we went to a judo tournament. Now, we did very well. We would meddle like crazy. But, I mean, my parents have stacks of newspaper clippings of 
the Kichisai Dojo with another medal at the, uh, you know, at this event or that event. I remember I got Athlete of the Week at one time because I, I medaled in, I took 22 gold medals in 24 tournaments in two years and, and uh, two bronzes or something like this. And, you know, so I got Athlete of the Week, but we were in the newspaper constantly. So everybody knew who you were because you were the judo kid, right? And so you'd get this support from people because everyone knew who you were. Me going to some regional event and meddling is probably not going to make the Toronto Star. Uh, so I think that community support is, is really powerful as well. Absolutely. Uh, and we see it uh, time and time again. Um, and I go back to Katrina LeMay Dolan. Um, she came from Saskatoon, which is a relatively small uh, town. Mm -hmm. And, and the, those stories are told over and over again. Uh, some of Canada's great athletes down through the years have, have come from smaller areas and not necessarily Toronto, Montreal, um, Vancouver, where there are uh, some excellent facilities. And eventually, as an athlete, uh, and yourself included, you have to go to the bigger centers right. to get the better coaches, um, to get the better competition, to improve to the point where you could go to a Commonwealth Games and a, and a Pan Ams. Um, that's a simple fact. You can't stay in those smaller centers and be an Olympic champion. Right. Yeah, the, the, uh, it's funny about the Katrina LeMay Doan. So I grew up a, a big, I, I'm of that age. So 1998, when she won her first gold medal, I was uh, 15. So seeing her, a uh, spectacular athlete in a sport that I, I find very exciting to watch. I think both long track and short track speed skating are incredible to watch. I recently had a conversation in person with Michael Gilday, who, uh, for people that aren't aware, was held a world record for two years individually, and then he held a world record as part of the relay team in short track speed skating. In the 1,500 meters, and I called it. Oh, amazing. Look at that. See? Uh, and what a, what a great guy. And he, he now, again, this smaller community, his resume is as good as you can have for short track speed skating. Incredible. And he, he um, volunteers his time to coach at the local rink. Like, how crazy is Like, that's just so awesome. So, such a cool guy. But the one about Katrina, who's a long track speed skater and Olympic champion, is one of my best friends, Fraser Will, took seventh place in the Beijing Olympics. Until then, he was a national champion many times, went to world championships. So in like 2003, I remember him telling me this story, he competed at 60 kilos, so he's five foot two, and he's from Star City, Saskatchewan, with a whopping population of about 500 when he grew up. Same thing, he, his first sensei, I think might have been a blue belt, like not even a black belt. Some guy that was a couple years older than him in high school basically teaching him. So he won athlete of the year and he said he never felt in such a funny place. He goes up to receive the award for best male athlete and the person who got best female athlete for Saskatchewan, he got it for the province, was Katrina LeMay Dunn. So he says, I'm standing beside an Olympic champion. I'm not sure how tall Katrina is, but she's an imposing athletic you know, figure and he's 5'2", and he was national champion, I think, at the time, and he said, I've never felt so insecure standing beside an Olympic champion doing what she did, and he's like, I think I went to Pan Ams at the time. He went, he, you know, he hadn't medaled. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty awesome to to, to hear that, and, and, uh, and kind of a funny little story about, about uh, the Saskatchewan sporting group. <clears throat> um, so the... The one thing that I was curious about as well is you you broadcast for so long at a time when it wasn't what it is now. What what drove you to becoming that um, so many years ago? Well, let me tell you the story. Um, I was playing football for the St. Mary's Huskies. Um, I was quarterback and I got a call from the coach Bob Hayes and uh, Bob you know I was a backup and um, I was never going to be the all-time first string quarterback 
So when I heard his voice, I thought, oh gosh, it's Bob. He's going to tell me I, you know, don't bother showing up. You're, you're finished. Right. And his first question was, Armitage, can you type? And I thought, mm, do I say yes or no to that question? Right. I had no idea what he was, in what direction he was heading. And he said, I just got a call from the CBC, and they're looking for a guy to write the late night television, but you have to be able to type. And I said, Bob, I took a typing course in high school because my buddy and I liked the odds. There were 38 girls in the class, and we were going to be the only two guys. Right. So that's why I took typing. I could type. And he said, OK, go to CBC. I did the interview. And they said, great, you're hired, you can type. And I wrote a late night sports for the announcers who knew nothing about sports. Mm -hmm. And I got paid $35 a week. Hmm. And I worked from 9 at night to 1 o'clock in the morning. And I did that seven days a week. Wow. And gradually, they began to send me out to do interviews. And then they put me on the radio. And I started in radio in Halifax, and then eventually they said, the TV spot is opening up for somebody to do the early sports. And I thought, well, TV is where it's at. So I started doing TV in Halifax. Um, I got a call from Toronto saying that Canada Summer Games are in Burnaby, BC in 1973. And uh, you're from Dartmouth, which is the hotbed of paddling, you must know something about the sport, you're it. So I right. went to Burnaby, BC, and I did the rowing and paddling without a color commentator. And uh, when I got home in late August, I got a phone call saying there's a job opening up in Vancouver. We'd like you to apply. So I applied and I got it. And uh, I moved to Vancouver in 1973. And uh, I was there for 38 years and, and gradually moved up and began to do play-by-play -play of, of various things. The only play-by-play -play I had done was football in Halifax. I did a game of the week out of the uh, Atlantic uh, University Football uh, Conference. And I did some high school football, but that was the only play-by-play. -play. So as I moved on and, and I did a lot of sports that nobody else wanted to do. Uh, and that's how I got to things like swimming and diving and uh, track and field, triathlon, boxing, um, you name it. Mm -hmm. I basically did it. My theory was, and I tell young kids this, never say no to anything. Mm -hmm. Always say yes. And, and some things you might find you're good at and you enjoy, others you go, yeah, I can't do that, won't do that, mm -hmm. and you stay away from it. But the ones that you enjoy, um, yeah, you might get a chance to, to move up to the national, international, and Olympic level, which is the highest for most amateur sports. I was lucky enough to get hired by Hockey Night in Canada in 1978, and I did CFL for, uh, I did 27 Grey Cups. Um, 29 seasons of hockey in Canada, uh, which is as good as it gets in Canadian broadcasting. Right. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've had the best seat at some of the major sports events in the world mm -hmm. over the last 50 years. And it's it's been a hell of a ride, and I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's... it's uh... It's, it's so obviously true. That's one thing that I really appreciate is like that is so obviously true how much you enjoy it. Just any time we've conversed prior to today and as well as today, like you're so engaging and engaged in it. Um, I mean, we can't even break the tip of the iceberg in terms of the things that you've got to be a part of and get to call. And the, the other part that's awesome that is really um, that people might not fully be aware, especially if they're a little bit younger, is I don't know what year TSN even became an entity, but I believe it was in the early 1980s. Um, yes. And then you have Rogers Sportsnet, that that wasn't an entity until, I don't even know, the 90s? Maybe the mid-90s? Yeah. Um, 
TSN, TSN went on the air in the fall of 1984. Uh, I was offered a job along with John Wells, who, who accepted their offer uh, at the Olympics in Los Angeles. And uh, they went from there, but they came on the air in 84, 85, and Sportsnet would have been another 10, 12 years after the TSN. Right, so we're so used to all of these avenues to watch sport now. And that wasn't the case then. Uh, it it was. But you won't you won't see a lot of amateur sport on TSN right. and, and Sportsnet. Right. Unfortunately. Right. Right, and that's and that's the other part that's very exciting. Like as a judoka, that's the only way we ever saw judo, which was only at the Olympic time. And and I'm hoping that they will do more coverage. And they've, I believe. The World Championships leading into those Olympics, CBC broadcast that. They streamed the World Championships, and that's when we got our second World Champion. Jessica Klimkate won the World Championships last spring going into those Olympics. Um, so the CBC has started doing that more as well, now that streaming is a lot more readily available. But, but yeah, the broadcasting of sports was so limited. Like when you started, I think it was in 1965, when you started with CBC, um, that it, sports weren't broadcast. You couldn't flick the channels and watch and have different avenues of sports. That wasn't the case. And so it, uh, yeah, so that, that's sort of an interesting thing that now we have so much more access and yeah, for the vast majority it's professional sport. There's some amateur sport that we might see, um, but that's pretty rare or you might see a professional sport at a more amateur level. TSN's done a really brilliant thing of, of creating this event that is the World Junior Hockey Championships. Um, in Canada, it's such a popular event, or if it's... CBC began that. Oh, it started in British Columbia, the tournament? No, no, it started in CBC. Oh, CBC, in oh, CBC started that. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, it's such a... And then TSN obtained the rights okay. from the Canadian Hockey Association and the World Juniors. Remember the big brawl in Europe? Uh, when the Canadians got into a massive fight on the ice with the Russians. Okay. What, that was CBC. Gotcha. Now. Right. So they sort of took it from that position and ran with it, and now it's... Yeah. now they it's ran with it, and they've done a terrific job yeah. in promoting it. I mean, my Christmas day, or Boxing Day, is watch the Canadian juniors at right. the World Championships, wherever they might be. And I think that's true of a lot of Canadians. It's become a holiday tradition to watch mm -hmm. the World Juniors. Yeah, and that's that's a full uh, full uh, compliments to uh, TSN for doing that. Yeah, the the time of year there's you know you have the you have the NBA um, Christmas Day game, but it is a real like. Um, spot of opportunity in terms of sport broadcasting and then you know NHL has such a strong audience in Canada and what you get to see is you get to see these guys before they make the NHL um, I'm an Edmonton Oilers fan even though I'm from Ontario weirdly enough and um, I'll I always remember Jordan Eberle having this incredible world juniors and being so excited this guy's a draft pick of the Edmonton Oilers and then I like that he was like a little guy and so that one stands out as this like all-time world junior hockey performance by someone who wasn't a number one overall draft pick. He was highly drafted, but um, but yeah, to see to see someone like that perform that way, and then it's your team, and then now you're so invested because again, my team. This guy's from my team. He plays for my team, and, and look at him at World Juniors. He's going to be a star and became a very good NHLer. But yeah, it's a it's like such a such a cool little time um, to to watch sport. But yeah, it's it's a it's really good. I I I always hoped and wished, and I think um, the new avenues with streaming provides a lot of opportunity. So, because I've always been like, oh, I, I just wish the score or somebody would put some judo on there. Um, and but obviously, judo's not always been the one at the forefront. And and I'm I also hope that the recent success, I, and I believe it will lead to a little more coverage because. The Canadian judo program is very strong right now, and it's an exciting sport for people to watch. There's a lot of action. Um, so yeah, the the other area that I wanted to touch on was was in terms of the evolution of sport. You've called things for so long, 
And one thing that I often hear, and I think is, is just common, is recency bias, where we always think, no matter what it is, culturally or educationally, we always think we're always doing the best. Everything now must be better than it's ever been. But when you look back at sport, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the case. I mean, you can easily still make an argument that Wayne Gretzky's if not the greatest, he's definitely very high up there. His career was a long time ago, or Bobby Orr. And, but there is definitely evolutions in the game, and I was wondering what, what things, no matter the sport that you've seen or where you see some sport going that really excites you as a, as a sport enthusiast. Well, I, I think the, uh, the technology that we have today has changed a lot of sports. Uh, the equipment uh, has become better, stronger, lighter, um, and science got involved in, in so and uh, allowed athletes to, uh, to get better equipment. Um, our understanding of the human body has changed. Uh, so the way we practice, the way we compete um, is better. Uh, our understanding of nutrition uh, has made a huge difference for a lot of athletes uh, down through the years. Um, 25, 30 years ago, nobody ever talked about a team psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, now most athletes have access to, and most teams carry full-time uh, team psychologists so that athletes are able to uh, handle the pressure a little better by talking uh, to a, a psychologist. Um, there are so many ways it's changed. Facilities are better, better maintained. The ice in hockey rinks uh, right across the country is better than it used to be. It's faster. Um, the way sport is covered by television has improved dramatically uh, since I started. We have SOMO, we have ISO, uh, you know, so many different things, uh, high definition television, uh, digital sound uh, that, that gets the viewer into the game um, by showing you better pictures and better sound quality. Uh, there have been so many different changes. I'll give you one example. Um, I was involved for over 30 years with speech game. And for years, the skate was one piece. And they right. adopted what they called the clap skate, which had a hinge on the, on the heel, which allowed more of the blade on the ice for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. It changed the sport dramatically. Overnight, records began to fall. Right. Um, so that was one example of uh, technology applied to sport. But uh, just the basic... Uh, Sneaker, the running shoe. Just, just look how that's evolved mm -hmm. and how that's made they track athletes faster. Basketball players able to move quicker um, because of better shoe construction. Mm -hmm. Little things like that that have really dramatically changed uh, sport down through the years. Yeah, I think it was, I think my recollection was it was about the mid 90s with the collapsible skate not yeah. far before that 98 time and yeah I just remember hearing probably you tell us that uh, yeah. that it all the world records just started dropping they just started dropping quickly yeah. but once they changed that skate if you didn't skate with a collapsible skate you didn't stand a chance and the, the other one that was really similar at that time which was only allowed for a period of time was the Australian team and Ian Thorpe when they got that shark shark skin full body um, full body swimsuit yeah. and it would take some obscene amount of time to get into it because it was so fitted and that on one direction it was a smooth texture but when they pulled their arm back it almost gripped the water and same thing you just had world records just shattered and if you weren't wearing that I mean if you weren't Ian Thorpe as well he was a he was, he was, for people that don't know, Ian Thorpe was basically Michael Phelps before Michael Phelps. Not quite to that degree, but just he was truly sensational Australian. Uh, I don't know how many Olympic medals he won that year and how many golds. Um, a lot. Um, 
but yeah, he had this this full body suit, and they would I, it would again it was probably you telling us that it was it was designed after shark skin to sort of grip the water but move smoothly when they're pushing through it. It allowed you, it allowed you to float, and and the higher in the water you can get, the less resistance, mm -hmm. and you can go faster. Right. Eventually, FEMA, the governing body of international swimming, outlawed the suits, and they're back to the uh, to the basics, uh, which even to the playing field, because it was felt that the poorer nations couldn't afford these suits, which were very expensive. Right. And Nike would only provide so many to the elite athletes. So they took those suits away, went back to the older older style, right. and uh, tried to even the playing field. But it was an interesting era, um, as you pointed out. The world records just went into the tank. Right. Uh, it would have been interesting to see what Michael Phelps could have done with that suit. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the I other mean, he was eight gold medals in Beijing in 2008, but just uh, and 123 in his career. That number might have been even higher. It's it's such an insane number too to think of. The other one that you would have called yeah. so much of is you would have called so much hockey pre players wearing the helmet, which was, yes. <laughs> that's a pretty... No, I didn't do a lot of that because the helmets did come in um, just as I was getting involved okay. in, uh, in covering. The other sport that I covered a lot of uh, was soccer. I did the first ever home television World Cup in 1982, mm. uh, and I called the game uh, where Canada qualified for the first ever World Cup in St. John's, Newfoundland in 1986. So I go way back with the Canadian soccer program, and I'm thrilled to see Canada qualify once again for the World Cup, this time in, in Qatar. They're having a few problems now with right. the strike, but they're going to play, I think, sometime this week, uh, Curacao and then Honduras. Uh, but and I wish them the best of luck because the World Cup is one of the biggest sporting events I've ever covered. And I covered six of them. Um, wow. They're bigger in terms of popularity uh, than the Olympics because soccer is played worldwide mm -hmm. and everybody knows soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to explain the rules. Because most people have played it. It's a very simple, basic game and relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it has such great appeal to buy. And FIFA has done a tremendous job in promoting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's really special to see, um, as a coach myself, I like the idea that the coach can have an impact. And to see the career that John Herdman has had, I heard him speak once. Um, yeah. In maybe seven years ago, I haven't met him in person, but I did hear him speak once when he was working with the women's side. And you look at the success that the women's side had and continue to have um, since his arrival, which has been really, truly remarkable to watch and exciting to see these women like Christine Sinclair, one of the greatest goal scorers, maybe the greatest goal scorer ever, to see the success that they finally had. They they obviously had a lot of talent before he arrived, but they weren't putting it together. And then they just have this massive string of success that's continued. And he transfers over to the, to the men's side of the program. And then you see success like we've maybe never seen. This is the second qualification, but this team may have more talent than we've ever seen before and more potential. And so to see to see the impact he's had from one side to the other is, is really uh, remarkable to watch. It's really exciting. Back in the 80s, the Canadians could defend as well as any team in the world. They had uh, guys like Bruce Wilson and Bob Narduzzi. Uh, they had a very good midfield. Uh, the goaltending with Tino Lettieri uh, was very good. But they couldn't score goals. And this is one thing they do so well now. They're mm -hmm. very explosive. Right. And they can, they've got four or five different players that are quite capable of scoring goals. Whether or not they can do that against the Belgians and uh, Germans and the English uh, Spanish right. uh, remains to be seen, but uh, uh, yeah, 
the Canadians have finally solved that problem mm -hmm. and with a solid midfield and, and good uh, defenders and, and uh, good net money, um, yeah, they, uh, they'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, and the, the, the one thing, too, that we had spoken about amateur sport, uh, obviously we've been speaking about it a lot, but amateur sport compared to professional sport, and I, I used to always wonder, I think there's two major factors in the Canadian program success, so I used to always wonder, everyone that's, you know, what percentage of the, the Canadian population comes from other countries and how much of them are recent immigrants, it's a huge amount, and soccer's played in literally every country, so everyone knows about soccer, everyone in the world is passionate about it, or football, whatever you want to call it, and all of these people come to Canada, and there's obviously talented, athletic Canadians. I mean, uh, Donovan Bailey, you know, like we've had, or, you know, Andrew Wiggins in the NBA now, or Steve Nash, or, so there's obviously physically capable Canadians. There's lots of us, you know, there's not five million anymore, you know, um, and then everyone comes from soccer, and I used to think, what's going on? Like, how, and, and the number that I've heard is that, um, Canadian children involved in soccer is four to one to hockey because it's a much easier, cheaper program to get involved in. It occurs during the summer. And so I used to wonder why we were, I'll say terrible, why we didn't perform at the international level. And I think the new coach coming over is a big factor. But the other one is now that professional soccer is here, the money that is connected to it has allowed these... Um, the academy systems, the Vancouver Whitecaps and the TFC, and those systems have the money to develop people from a young age and put quality coaching in place. And that's one thing that I think about a lot is when we want to develop sports in this country, the more that people can do that as a living rather than just something that they do in their spare time, volunteers are amazing, but when you can support people, it is a lot of work to develop that talent. And I think the money flowing that way to the development of coaches at that level that can develop kids to get to the next stage is really, truly, um, really important in terms of developing kids in safe, healthy environments where you're looking out for the athlete first. You just uh, nailed it absolutely perfectly. It's all based on ka-ching, ka -ching money. And if money is available to develop and to hire good coaches and to build world-class facilities, and one of the most important factors is being able to have that team or group of athletes compete internationally. You can be great in Canada, but until you test yourself against the best in the world, you have no idea how far behind or whether you're equal or maybe even a little bit better. Hockey is a good example. For years and years, we thought we were the best. It wasn't until we started going overseas and playing the Russians mm -hmm. and the Finns and, uh, and the Slovaks on a regular basis that we realized they were doing things that we weren't. Mm -hmm. They were stressing skating and skills. We were still playing the game the way we did in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and nobody could beat us. Uh, so that's very important. But the money is the bottom line. If you don't have it as a sports organization, you're really bound uh, to stay in Canada. You've got to get out and spread your wings and learn to fly with the big birds. Right. Well, I just want to say I've taken up tons of your time and I'm so appreciative to get to chat with you today and thank you so much uh, for coming on and, and uh, it's not too many times in your life that you get to say I got to speak to a Canadian icon and a broadcasting icon and now as a, I'm going to say this, uh, uh, you know, to some degree, I guess, uh, now that I've called in Olympic Games, I can refer to you as a colleague to some degree. Um, yes, absolutely, 100%. When you get to call an Olympic shoot, uh, reached a level in broadcasting that uh, a lot of people uh, dream about, and you're there. And I expect to hear you uh, calling judo in Paris in 2024. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you.